Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. Welcome back to Fuck That. This week, I'm actually going to be covering a case that I covered previously, but I ended up archiving the episode not long after I recorded it. So if you listened to it already, I apologize. Not many people did, but I wasn't a fan of the way that I covered it. And then when I went back and reread through one of my sources, I noticed that it had a lot of contradictions. So I just ended up nixing that source altogether. Chad and I are currently wrapping up his coverage of Bulgarian prisons, so I'm going to be uploading that. We're still going to be getting together to do a part four, which is just going to be a casual dialogue between Chad and I. So if you have any questions about his case, feel free to send them to me and I will bring them up and have him answer that in that discussion as well. Additionally, the next case that's going to come out, I just want to prep everybody because I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit nervous about how everybody's going to react, but I was contacted several months ago from a former police officer who was in jail for some time for murder. I'm not going to elaborate any further because I don't want to give it away. He wanted to chat with me about his side of the story, and so I've been chatting with him and gathering a ton of information from various sources, so that will be the next case that I'm covering just to prepare you all. You guys know that I like to cover cases that are not easy and not black and white and that have multiple moving parts, and this is very much one of those cases. Okay, so today I am re-recording the story of Ronald Gene Simmons, the father from hell. I am just going to let everybody know right now, this entire episode has a trigger warning. This is going to be a very brutal case. I think that's why the first time I covered it, it just wasn't good because I was just unwell reading through all of this. It's just a lot. This guy is a giant piece of trash. So trigger warning for violence, sexual assault. Just listen to the entire episode with care. So this is a story of one of the most horrific crimes in American history And it was committed by a man who appeared on the outside to be a devoted father and husband. But behind closed doors, Ronald Gene Simmons was an absolute monster. I just listened to the playback to make sure my vocals sounded good. And I listened to the way that I said absolute. And I realized I sounded like Angelina from Jersey Shore, like super Long Island. I'm not from Long Island. So sorry about that. Going to try to not do that again. Anyway. Entire episode is a trigger warning, but the crimes of Ronald Gene Simmons are known as the worst mass murder in Arkansas history, and it is to this day the worst family massacre in United States history. During his crime spree, 16 people passed away, and 14 of those 16 were related to Simmons either by marriage or by blood. He went by Gene, but his first name was Ronald, and because I think this guy sucks, I'm going to call him Ronald and not Gene because fuck him. Ronald was born on July 15th, 1940 in Chicago, Illinois. He was the youngest of eight children and grew up in a very strict and religious household. Other than that, by all accounts, Ronald did have a normal childhood and was raised in a middle-class family. His mother, Eva Loretta, who went by Loretta, was adopted by her mother's sister and husband when she was put into an orphanage around age 10. Understandably so, this caused Loretta to have several challenges throughout her life with not only isolation, but fear of abandonment. But Loretta decided not to let this stop her. She decided to teach herself French, and she began to teach herself to play the piano. By 1929, Loretta enrolled in the School of Nursing at the Michigan Children's Hospital, but she unfortunately continued to have struggles there as well. She had a really hard time with all of the pressure put on her. We all know nursing is not an easy job. So she ended up leaving the hospital. She moved back to Rhode Island, which was where her adopted parents were, and she then began to give lessons in French and piano. 
Loretta met a man not long after, and by 1934, they ended up married. And this was a man named William Simmons. Does the last name sound familiar? It should. And Loretta was 25 at this point. Their relationship was incredibly turbulent. After the birth of their first child, which was a son, in 1935, they decided to split up. Loretta formally divorced William in 1936 and finished her degree summa cum laude in 1937, ladies. I feel like this is a testament to the fact that when we drop men, look at how well we do. I'm just kidding. Or am I? But anyway, I mean, she dropped her man. She finished her degree, summa cum laude. Anyway, shockingly to everybody around, she ended up, she fucking backslid. You never backslide. She remarried William in 1939. And, like I mentioned before, Ronald was born on July 15th, 1940, so they gave birth to another child. But they divorced again, because having children does not fix issues, people. I'm going to say that again, having children doesn't fix issues. So they divorced again, and then Loretta met a civil engineer, good for her, and remarried in 1943. This is really weird to me. I'm not trying to judge, but her second husband, his name was also William but William Griffin. I don't know if I could do that. But William was employed by the Army Corps. He was an engineer, which put the family now in a position where they would have to relocate often. This is what's known as PCS, permanent change of station, and it is a way of life with the military, but it can be very difficult for not only the person that's enlisted, but the family as well. So it can pose challenges. Now, because of this, Ronald was forced to move throughout the country several times, and this caused a lot of instability in his life. In 1955, Ronald was 14 turning 15. He was sent to Morris Academy, and this is a military school, and this was due to his consistent outbursts and bad behavior. He returned home to his family in 1956, but unfortunately, he was still a giant piece of shit. He consistently defied his mother, refusing to help her with anything that she asked, but he had absolutely zero fucking qualms with being a giant piece of shit to literally any person that he encountered. So nothing changed. And because of this, he obviously had no friends who would want to be friends with somebody like that. And he just isolated himself in his room day in and day out every day. On September 5th, 1957, Ronald told his parents that he intended to enlist into the United States Navy. He had asked for their permission since he was still a minor at that point, and they granted it. So he decided to drop out of high school, and he enlisted. Ronald was stationed in Washington, and it was there that he met a USO volunteer. If you don't know what USO is, it stands for United Service Organizations. So he met a USO volunteer named Rebecca Becky Ulibarri. The two immediately felt a connection, they fell in love, and by July of 1960, they were married in New Mexico. Ronald and Becky ended up having seven children together. Ronald Jr., Sheila, William, Loretta, after his mother, Rebecca Lynn, Marianne, and Eddie. In 1963, Ronald ended up enlisting into the Air Force, and this is where he made a lifetime career out of serving his country. He ultimately earned, during his United States Air Force career, a Bronze Star, a Marksmanship Ribbon, and the Republic of Vietnam Cross. In May of 1964, he was promoted to Airman First Class, and by 1965, he was promoted again to Staff Sergeant, which is a very big deal. But unfortunately for his family, the more success Ronald had, the more money he made. Even though his wife Becky was at home alone taking care of all of their children, Ronald decided that he was never going to give her money to support the family. He was a controlling person inherently, and he wanted to exert his authority in every single way possible. Here's an example. To save just $50 a year, 
Ronald moved his family into the trailer park on base. Remember how many children they have. This only saved him $50 a year. Now, with inflation, that's about $480 today, which is not an insignificant amount of money. But when you're thinking of a family of that many people to save just $480, for a couple that has seven children, I just don't know that that's personally worth the sacrifice. And I'm not knocking on people that can't afford otherwise because you have to do what you have to do. But in this case, he is choosing to make a very uncomfortable living situation for his family just to save $480, which he has. Ronald's career was on the upwards path at this point. By 1969, he was one of 20 staff sergeants that was selected to promote to technical sergeant, which is obviously an even bigger deal. This is great news for him. Should be great news for his family but it wasn't. And this is because life at home was not ideal. Ronald did a really good job of living two separate lives. There was the Ronald that was in the military. He kept to himself. He was professional. He worked hard. But the Ronald at home was very, very different. The Ronald at home was verbally abusive to Becky. He was incredibly controlling. He did everything he could to prevent her from having any crumb of independence. He prevented her from getting her driver's license. He didn't want her to work. He didn't want her to have the ability to leave the house. Now, this was because Ronald saw this as a threat to his control and his authority that he had over the household. So the more that Becky tried to become a woman of her own, the more that Ronald increased his abuse. And in his mind, all of the punishment that he doled out towards Becky, this was all her fault for trying to develop her own kind of sense of independence. This translated across the entire household as well. It wasn't just with his wife, Becky. He ran a very strict house. Ronald ran his house like a boot camp. He wanted his home to be very well kept and orderly. Nothing could be out of line. He expected his children, no matter what age, to consistently complete housework, and if they happened to finish all of their duties, they were not rewarded for this. Ronald would then make more up. But because he was so abusive and toxic, he obviously wanted to shield everybody away from this. So because of this, in his personal life, Ronald was very much an outsider. He wanted to keep himself and the family tucked away from the world because if somebody on the outside saw his behavior, they would obviously, even in the 1960s, 1970s, because he's so extreme, they would perceive this to be not normal and abusive. And so therefore, he did everything he could to kind of shield himself and his personal life and his family away from that. I know I said it before, but I'm just going to say it again. This part's going to be really rough. It's going to be exceptionally rough. I'm going to start talking about sexual abuse, so just keep that in mind. Unfortunately, Ronald's abuse didn't just stop at the way that he abused his wife and the way that he had isolated them from the outside world and subjected his children to manual labor. Nope, this wasn't enough. Unfortunately, when his daughter Sheila turned 13, she began to receive very inappropriate attention from her father. At first, Sheila, as well as her mother and some of the other children that began to pick up on it, they thought it was seemingly innocent. They thought that Ronald was just complimenting her. Maybe she was maturing and she was looking more beautiful. They didn't think anything of it, which is natural. It is the last place your brain is going to go to think, hey, my father is going to cross that boundary, right? So at first they thought that he was just complimenting her, doing extra things for her. This progressed up until the age of 17. Once Sheila turned 17, Ronald put Sheila through something that nobody, no man, woman, nobody should ever go through, but especially at the hands of their own father. And he began to sexually assault her. This is the part where I derailed when I first recorded this episode, and it's just, I don't know. 
I don't know how to record episodes without my own emotional reaction. I'm going to try, but it's just going to get inherently shittier from here. And it's just, ugh, I have so much to say. Ronald ends up getting his own daughter pregnant. I, I don't believe in the death penalty, like at all. I know that's controversial and you guys probably don't care. If you believe in it, I support however you feel, but I don't. But in this case, oh my God, give this guy the death penalty because how can you fucking do this to your child? So at 18, Sheila gave birth to her daughter, Sylvia, who was fathered by her fucking father, Ronald. I, ugh, I don't, all right, I don't have anything else to say about that. Now there is a silver lining to this. Thankfully, Sheila's school became suspicious during her pregnancy. So they decided to investigate and just make sure that she was okay. They wanted to determine what was going on with her because she did not know any boyfriend or anything of the matter. So they were, they were concerned that maybe there was something nefarious going on. And I'm grateful that they did this. The school ended up suspecting incest and sexual abuse. But unfortunately, by the time they began to kind of put the puzzle pieces together, Ronald figured out that they were under investigation and they were likely to get caught. So this prompted him to act quickly. So unfortunately, Ronald was one step ahead. He ended up retiring from the Air Force. And on August 4th, 1981, Shortly after he retired, he uprooted his family in the middle of the night. And this was unbeknownst to anybody except for himself. He ended up packing up a U-Haul and he moved to Arkansas with just Sheila and Loretta with him at the time. And this was because he had retired and taken a civilian job at the Little Rock Air Force Base. Now, the rest of the family was in New Mexico, which is where they were living at the time. And a week later, after he moved with just Sheila and Loretta, there was an arrest warrant out for Ronald in New Mexico for incest charges. And Becky was forced to handle moving the rest of the children. And Becky was also forced to do all of this while dealing with these charges since Ronald had already fled New Mexico to Arkansas with Sheila and Loretta. Now, once the entire family had relocated to Arkansas, Ronald decided that it was time to come clean to Becky, his wife, about his relationship with Sheila, and he confessed to Becky that he was the father of Sylvia. In typical scumbag fashion, Ronald demanded that Becky keep her mouth shut and insisted that she would continue to act like nothing was wrong and told her that she needed to help to raise Sylvia whilst keeping her mouth shut. Now, Becky didn't leave Ronald after this, and pretty much every single source that I read through really slighted Becky for this, and I know it may seem insane that she didn't leave after this, and I'm not exonerating her for that choice, but remember, I just want you guys to keep in mind that this entire family has been brutally abused physically and emotionally by this man for their entire lives. And it's easy for us to look at this from an outside opinion and say, well, why the fuck didn't she leave? But it's, and again, I'm not advocating her staying, but I do want you to think that it's not that simple when you're in an abusive relationship. It's never that easy. It's never that attainable. And I think that Becky felt like if she left, that not only would her life be in danger, but her children's lives would be in danger as well. So I think that this was Becky's way of staying close and making sure that not only she didn't get hurt, but she could also make sure that her children and now her grandchild wouldn't get hurt as well. Now, their first son was Ronald Jr. He also preferred to go by Gene, so I'm going to call him Gene Jr., but I'm not going to give the father, the subject of this case, that satisfaction because he fucking sucks. But I will give that to his son because his son did no wrong. So Gene Jr. grew up. He left the family home. He got married to a lovely woman named Wilma. And they began to start their own family. This was something that made Ronald happy in whatever sense that this piece of trash can feel happiness. But unsurprisingly, this was not something that he felt when 
one of his other children decided to do the same. And if you're guessing that it was Sheila, you are correct. Remember, Sheila is the one that he abused and was the father to her first daughter named Sylvia. So now when she followed in her brother's footsteps, she met a man named Dennis McNulty, and this made Ronald very, very upset, and he was obviously jealous of the relationship. Now, the Simmons family is still living in Arkansas at this point, but shortly after Sheila met Dennis McNulty, Ronald relocated the family again to a different area in Arkansas, and this has not been officially confirmed as to why he did this, but many relatives and others that knew the family surmised that it was likely to avoid legal issues once again. But then there's another group that believe it was to distance Sheila from Dennis. Personally, I am inclined to believe it's the latter, but that's just my best guess. So Ronald moved the family to a 13-acre mobile home right outside of Dover, Arkansas in 1983. Now, I'm going to backtrack to how Sheila met Dennis, and they met in school. And according to all accounts, Dennis was an absolute gem of a human. Sheila, who had been through so much in her short life, was able to confide in Dennis regarding everything she went through, thanks to Satan, Ronald. But in spite of all of this, Dennis accepted Sheila's past and loved her and cared for her regardless. Dennis also decided that he was going to take Sylvia on as his own and that he was going to raise her as if he was her birth father, which is wholesome. Now, what I love most about Dennis is that he stood up to Ronald without fear and made it abundantly clear that he would never allow Ronald to hurt Sheila or Sylvia ever again. Now, you would think, as a parent, that this is the kind of love that you would want for your child. I know that if I ever become a parent, this is exactly what I would want, and I would want nothing less for my child. But no, Ronald is obviously a monster, and he was fucking pissed because he saw Sheila as another part of his property. And Dennis was infringing upon his inherent right to her as his property. Now, at this point, when he realized that Dennis was not letting up, he began to do even more, doing everything in his power after relocating the family again to keep them separate. But at this point, he realized that his kids were growing and he could only do so much. Shortly after relocating, Sheila and William, who goes by Billy at this point, they get a job at Hardy's. I had to look up what Hardy's is because I am in the Northeast. We don't have that here. It's a fast food restaurant. It, it looks good. I'm not going to lie. But they get a job at Hardy's. And shortly after Easter of that same year, Sheila announced that she was engaged to Dennis. And Ronald's response to this was to acquire a 22 caliber revolver. So going back to what I mentioned earlier about Ronald wanting to keep everybody out on this new property, he decided that he was going to build a large privacy wall. And this was to ensure that absolutely nobody could see into their property. To do this, Ronald enlisted the help of his smallest children, making them move heavy blocks around amongst other ridiculous chores to accomplish this task. And he finally finished this bizarre, weird wall in the summer of 1984. He's trying to be Trump. We need to build a wall. I'm sorry, I needed to break that up a bit. <sighs> All right, so he built the wall. Now again, Sheila had left the house at this point. She was engaged and she knew, everybody in the house knew at this point that it was unsafe. And Sheila, she had her daughter, Sylvia, and so she decided, I have to keep myself safe. I have to keep my daughter safe. So while Sheila felt bad leaving her mother and her other siblings behind, for the sake of her child, she decided that she was going to move out with her fiancé, Dennis. But the problem with this is, and it's not Sheila's fault at all, but this absence 
sunk Ronald into an even deeper depression, which caused him to then harass Sheila relentlessly. He ended up writing her dozens of letters that ultimately went unanswered. In September of 1984, Sheila and Dennis ended up getting married. And in October of 1985, Billy followed in Sheila's footsteps and he married a young woman named Renata. And Renata and Billy planned to move to San Antonio. And at this time, Renata was pregnant. So everybody was happy for Renata and Billy, except for Ronald. Ronald, who is an evil snail, if you don't watch The Office, then you won't understand that. And I don't feel bad for you for not getting it because you should be left out if you don't watch The Office. But anyway, Ronald, who is an evil snail, could not feel happiness for Billy and Renata. And to make things worse for Ronald, who fucking deserves it because he sucks, by the spring of 1986, Sheila and Dennis welcomed a son together named Michael. Not only did Sheila's departure from the home have an impact on Ronald, but her getting married and then ultimately having a child with her husband, who wasn't him, had an immense impact on him. It damaged his pride. It damaged his ego. And to Ronald, this is something that nobody ever does to him. Ronald could not cope with the fact that one of his own children, especially the one that he favored the most, would ever dare to leave his control, and this sent him spiraling into a deep rage. Ronald's fragile little ego was shattered by Sheila leaving, so to compensate for this, he decided that he was going to tighten the leashes on everybody in the household that he already had a tightened leash on. Ronald forced the remaining children into even more grueling labor around the property, And at one point, he forced them to dig a large hole that was around five feet deep without any explanation. The only person who was allowed to leave the household, and this includes Becky, who is also an adult, his wife, but the only person that was allowed to leave the house freely was Ronald. Everybody else needed to be granted permission by, you guessed it, Ronald the fucking douche canoe. He then cut every single phone wire, and all communication both in and out of the household was cut off. This included the mail. Becky was under surveillance the most out of everybody else, and I suspect this is because Ronald knew that he was such a shitty husband. I feel like not even somebody like Stephen King or Stanley Kubrick could dream up a character as sinister as Ronald. And I feel like he knew this. I feel like he knew that he sucked so hard. So he needed to keep Becky extra close because she's obviously aware. Everybody's aware. And he needed to make sure that she didn't leave like Sheila did. So for Becky, the only way that she could read her mail is if he pre-screened it. And if he decided that he didn't want her to read it, he would just throw it away, which was 99% of the mail that she read, even if there was nothing to it. Becky began discussing things openly with her children at this point. They were getting older, and they all decided as a whole that she should get a P.O. box so that she could stay in contact with the other children that had left the home. So the three children that had left the home were Jean Jr., Sheila, and Billy. Loretta, Rebecca Lynn, Marianne, and Eddie still remained living in the home with Becky and Ronald. So now I'm going to talk about the actual crimes themselves. I'm going to try to keep the details as minimal as possible because it's beyond horrendous. The brutality of this case is just, it's a lot. None of us need to know the absolute specifics. I think that we can understand the severity without it. So I'm going to be detailed, but I'm going to also try to be sensitive to the details that none of us need to hear or know. So it is December 22nd, 1987, a time that is really exciting for all kids because they're going to be going on Christmas break. They don't have to go back to school until after the new year. And this was a particularly special time of year in the Simmons family for their children. After his children got onto the bus, Ronald heard Becky go back to the room that she was sharing with Rebecca Lynn 
Barbara, and Marianne. Now, just to clarify, Ronald thought that he was the shit, even though he's not. He sucks. So he got his own room. And Rebecca Lynn is one of their daughters, but Barbara is Jean Jr.'s daughter. So during the Christmas break, you have Becky, his wife, who shares a room with Rebecca Lynn, their daughter, and Marianne. But in addition, Barbara is also staying there. Again, that's Jean Jr.'s daughter. And at the time, she was three years old. Again, trigger warning, this is really brutal. So just keep that in mind. So once he hears his wife, Becky, go back to the room that she's sharing with their two daughters and his three-year-old granddaughter, he walks out to his back porch where he kept a slew of shit, mainly his tools, and he grabbed a 2.5 by 1 inch galvanized pipe. When he came back inside, he wedged a broomstick into the living room sliding glass door, which ensured that it was locked because he laid it like on the track so nobody could open it that way. Ronald then grabbed his 22 revolver that he bought when he found out that Sheila was engaged, and he tucked it into his belt. And he loaded his pockets with hollow point ammunition. Just a quick side note on hollow point ammunition. So a common misconception with hollow points, people think the entire bullet is a hollow point. That's not actually true. The nose of the bullet is hollow. So what happens is, is when the bullet hits the target, the nose expands. So when it hits impact on a soft target, that nose opens up. And ultimately, these kinds of bullets cause more extensive damage. But What's interesting about hollow points is that it's different than something like a buckshot, which can have what's called overpenetration. So there can be spray, you can hit multiple targets. This one is more concentrated penetration, but unfortunately with hollow points is once that bullet hits soft tissue or it hits its intended target, then that nose then expands. So it is a controlled penetration, but it causes so much more damage, which is really significant in this case. So obviously, since Barbara, Jean Jr.'s daughter, was there, this means that Jean Jr. was also staying there for the holidays. And when Ronald grabbed the revolver with the hollow points, he went towards Eddie's room. And this is where Jean Jr. was staying. He was sleeping here, and he was the first child to leave the house and start his own family. This is obviously something that can't be proven, but I suspect that this is symbolic, that this is exactly where he went. He went directly to Jean Jr. first, and Jean Jr. was the first person to leave the household, so I feel like he did this tactfully. Ronald entered the room where Jean Jr. was sleeping, and he struck his son with the pipe, across his head and shoulders, but Gene Jr. had sprung up and was immediately prepared to defend himself. Ronald, being the little bitch that he was, panicked and grabbed the twenty-two from his belt, and he shot his son essentially point-blank in the chest. Gene Jr. went for the door, but Ronald then shot him again, but this time he shot him twice in the head. Ronald then went across the hall where his wife, Becky, was with their granddaughter, Jean Jr.'s daughter, Barbara. He struck his wife in the head with the pipe and then shot her twice in the head. This is really rough. I've said it a million times, but I'm going to say it again. This is really rough. Trigger warning. He decided to manually strangle his three-year-old granddaughter. I'm not saying one is better than the other because it's all atrocious, but I can't reconcile, nor do I want to reconcile or understand why he chose to use a pipe versus a gun versus strangulation. I mean, I suspect it's because he's really sick and he wants to have control and he wants to do it slowly. I just, I don't know. I just can't picture somebody killing their own family, especially a three year old. And then it's like you choose the slowest way to do it. Ah, I'm not going to bother to try to understand it. It's just, it's shitty no matter how you unpack it. 
After all of this, Ronald rushed outside to make sure that the neighbors didn't hear any of the events that just occurred. And then he went back inside and grabbed himself a beer. He then tore apart the inside of the trailer that they lived in, breaking holes into the walls, tearing the doors off of various cabinets. And he did this to attempt to make it look like the home was ransacked by an intruder. Ronald then grabbed his wheelbarrow from the back of the home and used it to carry the bodies of his son, his wife, and his granddaughter to somewhere particular in the backyard. If you recall earlier in the episode, I had mentioned the manual labor that he forced his children into, and this is the part that I think, I mean, it's, there's a lot, but... This is top five of the parts that just makes me sick as to my stomach out of this episode. He had made his children dig a hole. Well, this was a pre-planned grave that he had his own children dig. He had his own children dig their own graves. So he grabbed a wheelbarrow and he very callously put his wife, his son that he named after himself, and his granddaughter into the wheelbarrow, and he brought it to the grave that he made his younger children dig. I I don't have anything to say about that. For some reason, Ronald decided that he needed to wrap the bodies in barbed wire, and he then doused them with kerosene. According to his logic, he did this to make sure that bugs and animals kept away. I don't think this is true. I think he did it to keep people from investigating. After Ronald did this, he went back into the house. He poured himself some wine this time, watched television, and he then waited for his children to get home from school. Again, there were four children that remained in the home. Loretta was 17. She was the eldest. And then there was Rebecca Lynn, Marianne, and Eddie. And when it became that time, the school bus rolled around and they all got off the bus But they were really excited for Christmas break because Christmas was always a somewhat pleasant time in the Simmons household. It was a time of reprieve from the abuse that they went through. But after Sheila had left in March that previous year, things were a lot tougher than usual in the household. Again, Ronald's anger and depression had exponentially increased in the months following. So the children were looking forward to reuniting with their older siblings for the holiday and hoping that it would bring some kind of reprieve from everything that they were going through. So part of the familial ritual at this point is that Ronald would pick up the children off of the bus in his Chevy station wagon. And this is exactly what he did that day. He picked them up off the bus and he pulled up outside of their mobile home. Ronald then told his children that he had Christmas presents for each of them, but what he wanted to do was give the gifts to them individually, beginning with Loretta, who was the eldest. Now, obviously, the children aren't going to expect anything nefarious at this point, because why would they ever think that their father is going to harm them? I mean, this is a time of celebration, joy, a time to spend with family. So the children were eager, starting with Loretta. But once she got inside, she began to sense that something was off. And as Ronald urged Loretta into his room, where her gift was allegedly hiding, Loretta's inquisitive nature took a hold. So she was very inquisitive, observant, intelligent, and she immediately sensed that something was wrong and she wanted to leave. She expressed to her father, Ronald, I I feel uncomfortable. I want to leave. But Ronald, when she tried to leave, shut the door, which hit her in the face. And then he strangled her with a garrote. I'm going to say this once because it is repeated and I'd rather just not continuously say it because it's really fucked up. So if I imply that it was done again, this is what I'm referring to. So Loretta had already passed and he brought her down to the bathroom where he kept barrels of ration water 
because he's a psychopath that he used for the sink and the toilet. And he dropped Loretta in head first, even though he knew that she had passed. And this was to ensure that she was actually passed. He then brought her to her room and laid her on her bed. So if you hear me mentioning he did this again, please just know that that's what I'm referring to because I'd rather just not continuously say this because it's just, it's a lot. It's really fucked up. This is just, ugh. This is why I had such a hard time doing this case and still, I mean, so you have the rest of his children outside in the station wagon sitting there excited. They're listening to Christmas music like he told them to. And I just, I just can't. Ronald went back outside to the station wagon. They're there. They're excited. They're thinking their Christmas vacation has just begun. This just guts me. I mean, these are just, these are innocent kids that have already dealt with so much. And they're excited to be home from school for the holidays. They're excited to not do homework. I don't know. Ronald then calls Eddie into the home. And he does the same thing. After he kills Eddie, he does the same thing with Rebecca Lynn and Mary Ann. And Mary Ann, who I believe was the youngest at this point, was 11 years old. Which, it doesn't matter how old any of his children were, even though Loretta was 17. At the end of the day, these are all his children, and it's just such a horrific thing to do to children that you had. But I mean, he killed Gene Jr.'s daughter, who was only three years old. So it's obvious to me that this man has absolutely zero sympathy, zero empathy. He is only thinking about himself and his rage, and nothing else matters. What drives me insane about this is that after the first murders, he went and drank beer after the second wine, and he does this again. He decides he's going to rest while he watches television and drinks wine. And at this point, he's like, I'm going to ponder through the rest of my plan. Ugh, I wish there was just an infinite amount of arsenic in the wine. I mean, just fuck. I'm just picturing this fucking asshole douchebag sitting on the couch, like fucking resting, watching Will of Fortune. I just wish like an anvil would drop on his head like a fucking Looney Tunes cartoon because he sucks. So after this douchebag takes his well-needed rest, he then grabs some beer and goes to the back of the home with his wheelbarrow that he used to get his family out to the hole. He does this again, and then he lays them in the pit that he had dug. This case mentally exhausts me. I've been recording this over four hours. I just, and I feel bad for you guys that are listening. So take care of yourself after this. It's only going to get worse get a facial. I don't know. Do whatever you need to do to heal because this case fucking drains me. But in the same breath, I feel like it's also important to talk about things like this because I feel like it's more prominent than we realize. And I also think it's important to know red flags, warning signs, so that we can recognize potentially when something like this might be happening, not only to ourselves, but somebody that we come into contact with. So it's a catch-22. But I digress. Unfortunately, Billy and Sheila, which is crazy to me, I feel like this is a testament to how much Sheila loves her mother and her siblings. Truly, I mean, she's been through so much from Ronald that I feel like this is just a fucking testament to her unconditional love to the rest of her relatives. I just, I personally would not be able to do this. So I, I give Sheila a lot of credit in this situation to be able to face her father because the love for her siblings and her mother means so much more than what her father did to her. But nonetheless, Billy and Sheila were heading to their parents' house with their spouses for the holidays, and they were set to arrive on the 26th. Now, the massacre occurred on the 22nd, so... On December 23rd, which was the day after this, Ronald took his son's car, George Jr., to People's Bank, and he deposited a letter there that he wrote for Sheila into his safety deposit box. I'm going to read the letter, and I'm going to try to suppress vomit while I read it, but it says, 
quote, Sheila, you have lied to me, hurt me, destroyed me. Ugh, fuck. I don't, oh, God. And it will hurt you more than it will hurt me. I will see you in hell. I don't think so, Ronald, but okay. You forget about all the little things I had done for you and with you. You are my best friend, my confidant, and my love. You gave me the best years of my life and the worst. You have destroyed me, but I will see you in hell. There is so much to unpack there. I just feel like you could gather the world's most renowned psychiatrists in a room, and even they wouldn't be able to unpack it. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist. I did take a few counseling classes for my master's, which had nothing to do with counseling, but I was working at the time with substance abuse and alcohol use disorder populations, so I decided to take a few counseling courses. So I did a lot of work with the DSM-5 and related issues. So again, not a psychiatrist by any means, but I did read a lot through the DSM-5. And I think it's interesting to kind of compare a lot of Ronald's traits to narcissistic personality disorder. Again, I cannot formally diagnose anybody. I'm not a psychiatrist. I don't have the background to do so. But I think it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast. So I'm going to read directly from the DSM-5 and I'm going to cite it in the show notes. But for narcissistic personality disorder, the diagnostic criteria is as such quote, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration, and lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts, as indicated by five or more of the following. So there's nine, and I don't think they all apply, but according to the DSM, they only need five. I definitely think one applies. Has a grandiose sense of self-importance, Example, exaggerates achievements and talents, expects to be recognized as superior without commensurate achievements. Two, I feel like this fits his character as well. Preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Three, believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people. Not sure that fits. But four, for sure requires excessive admiration. Five, absolutely has a sense of entitlement. For example, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations very much applies. Six, is interpersonally exploitative. For example, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Seven, 100% lacks empathy, is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. With the limited knowledge I have, I'm not really sure that eight or nine applies, but eight is, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Nine, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. At the very least, he has a grandiose sense of self-importance, which is number one, Number two, he's preoccupied with unlimited power. Number four, he requires excessive admiration. Number six, he is interpersonally exploitative. He lacks empathy. So to me, he just seems very narcissistic. He consistently controls every narrative and controls every single behavior throughout his entire family. And it's just obsessive. So by noon on the 26th, he heard a car door outside of his home. He grabbed his 22 revolver that he bought when Sheila decided she was going to move on from this life with his hollow point bullets. And as he heard his son, Billy, and his wife, Renata, outside, along with her baby, Trey, he decided it was time to take action. Now, Ronald coerced them inside by explaining that Jean Jr. had gone for a walk with Sheila, who had not yet arrived, and Becky, their mother. So he gets them inside, and he coerces them into opening presents, as he did with his other children. And once where he gets his son Billy where he wants him, Ronald shoots him multiple times, then turning the gun on Renata, who had Trey with her. 
Ronald then murdered Trey the same way that he murdered his other grandchild, Barbara, and then brought him into the bathroom. I don't want to repeat it, but it's in the same fashion. What is really weird to me is that with the children, he kills them and then needs to ensure that they have passed by bringing them into the bathroom. To me, it's just, I don't know. I I can't wrap my brain around it. I don't understand the thought process, but it's just bizarre that he needs to make sure, but he needs to make sure with the babies. I just, I don't know. It's just a bizarre facet to this case, and I don't understand his logic behind that. Because it's like, okay, if he's thinking from like a, I don't want to sound brass, but like if he's thinking from a liability perspective, they're obviously the least likely to leave the house and get help. So why is he so hellbent on making sure that they are that they have passed? It's just it's weird. You would think that that's something that he would do with the adults. So psychologically, I'm not sure where he's at. It's obviously a really dark place, but it was just always weird to me that he needed to make double sure with the youngest of the bunch. It's just it's just fucked. Shortly after this, Sheila arrived with her husband Dennis and her daughter. That was Ronald's daughter, Sylvia, and Sheila and Dennis's son, Michael. Sheila came in first with Sylvia, who ran in excitedly with Michael in her arms while Dennis unloaded the car. Ronald immediately confronted her. Fuck. Ronald immediately confronted her, shooting her in the head, which caused Dennis to run inside because that's his wife and his two children are inside. Dennis and Ronald struggled, but Ronald shot him. And then Ronald shot Sheila twice more in the head when he realized she was still alive. Just he shot her once in the head and then two times more. The amount of rage that goes into that is incomprehensible. It's going to get really weird and dark, and I know I've said it before, but just just another trigger warning. Ronald then brought Sylvia into Loretta's bed and tucked her in. He then grabbed Michael, his grandbaby, who was curled into a ball on the couch and afraid because he just watched his mother and father get murdered. And he brought him into the bedroom and did the same thing that he did with the other grandchildren, then bringing him into the bathroom. Now, Sylvia, who was his daughter, he brought into Loretta's bed and tucked her in. And I think that that's significant because what he does with Michael and Trey, his other grandchildren, is much more callous. So another trigger warning for that. And I'm sorry to have to say it, but it's unfortunately part of the case. But He brought Michael into the dining room and he laid him there. And then he grabbed garbage bags and wrapped Trey and Michael in them. And he placed them into the trunks of their parents' abandoned cars. He used blankets to cover everybody except for Sheila. Sheila was his daughter, was unfortunately the mother of his child Sylvia he was very much in love with her so he placed Sheila under the tree and folded her hands across her chest and draped a special tablecloth over her Unsurprisingly, Ronald slept like a baby following the attack, and he felt the need to celebrate. So the next day, which was a Sunday, he went to a private club where he ate, drank, and lived his best life. Like he didn't just murder his entire family. That night that he partied, he ended up going back home and sleeping on the couch close to Sheila, who he still left under the Christmas tree. On December 28th, Ronald took Jean Jr.'s car and drove to a Walmart in Russellville, where he purchased a pistol, and then he decided he was going to drive to a woman named Kathy Kendrick's house, 
Kathy was a secretary Ronald had previously worked with at a freight company that he had an absolutely disgusting infatuation with, and Kathy graciously turned down his advances. But Ronald was not okay with this, and so he felt like he needed to exact revenge. When Ronald arrived to Kathy's house, he realized that she wasn't home, so he drove to Glenwood to the law firm where she was currently employed. Ronald went inside and approached the desk where Kathy worked and immediately shot her in the head four times, killing her. Thankfully, unfortunately, because she had to go through this ordeal, but thankfully the silver lining to this is that a woman named Linda, who was another legal secretary at the firm, had seen what had happened and immediately called the Russellville Police Department. Ronald immediately left and drove towards Taylor Oil Company, owned by a man named Rusty Taylor, who had also owned Sinclair Mini Mart. Ronald recently resigned from the Mini Mart and apparently hated Rusty because of this. When he got to the oil company, he shot Rusty through his office door, and as he left, he shot another man named Jim J.D. Chaffin as he walked through a dock door. Ronald did not know J.D. He was also a firefighter, but he worked at the oil company part-time, and unfortunately, he had passed away instantly. Ronald had sensed that there was somebody else in the building behind him, so he fired again at a woman named Julie, and this was her first day on the job. Thankfully, he missed, and she was also able to call Russellville Police Department to report the murders. But Julie had also gotten the make, model, and color of the car, and she was able to give a very concise description of Ronald. Ronald was not done with Sinclair Mini Mart, so he headed towards the Mini Mart, which was the place where he had recently put in his resignation. Ronald walked in and came across a woman that he had worked with named Roberta, but she was always kind to him, so he decided to walk past her and towards his former boss. David Salyer. David was sitting with his friend Tony Serta at a table in the corner of the mini mart, and he had his gun held in front of him. Roberta noticed this as he fired a shot towards his former boss, who was able to somehow avoid it. Roberta ended up screaming at Ronald and asked him what he was doing. She then grabbed the phone in an effort to call 911, but Ronald ended up responding by shooting her twice in the head and shoulder. David, his former boss, decided that he didn't want to wait to watch Roberta die or see himself get shot or his friend Tony, so David grabbed a chair and charged at Ronald with everything he had, while Tony, who, by the way, was 71, decided he also was not going to sit idly by and watch this happen. So he grabbed, like a gangster, a six-pack of soda and chucked it at Ronald's head with everything he had. He then proceeded to grab more cans and just rapidly started hurling them at his head as fast as he could. This caused Ronald, obviously, to retreat and run out of the door because he is not brave. He's a piece of shit. And Roberta, who was shot in the head and the shoulder, called 911 and was able to complete the call. And she was able to distinctly identify the shooter. And she also was able to let them know that he quit in not good terms, just a few weeks prior. Ronald then sped off and pulled into Woodline Motor Freight Company parking lot. He contemplated suicide at this point, but decided that a jury would definitively find him guilty and that he would likely be sentenced to death, so he decided to not commit suicide. This company was yet another former employer of Ronald. It seems that as soon as he retired from the military, in a rush to relocate, his work performance went downhill and he was not able to keep a job. So this was another employer. He went inside and immediately shot an innocent woman named Joyce Butts. She was sitting at her desk, but she survives, thankfully. So there's there's good news there. But then, unfortunately, Ronald approaches another employee named Vicky, who was friends with Kathy. This is the secretary at the law office that he was infatuated with and that he had shot first once he left the scene from killing his family. 
Vicky had Ronald's number and she had panicked immediately, but for some odd reason, Ronald assured her that he wasn't going to hurt her and that he was going to turn himself in. And thankfully he meant it. Ronald asked Vicky to call the police while he stood by and casually smoked a cigarette. During that call, he asked Vicky if she wanted one. Vicky instructed dispatch at Ronald's request that she had possession of one of his guns and that Ronald would give the second gun as long as the police, quote, don't come barging in. Ronald was later apprehended by Chief Johnston and he turned himself in without a struggle, for whatever reason. The trial began May 9, 1988 in Franklin County for the events that occurred in Russellville. This did not include the execution of his entire family. Testimony went on for four days, and he was found guilty of murder, attempted murder, and false imprisonment. Now his sentence for this was death with an additional 147 years. Ronald smiled when his verdict was read, and he had asked to read a statement. His statement was, quote, My statement is that if the jury renders the most proper and just and wise sentence of death in this case, I, Ronald Jean Simmons Sr., want it to be known that it is my wish and my desire that absolutely no action by anybody be taken to appeal or in any way change the sentence. It is further requested that the sentence be carried out expeditiously. I want no action that will delay, deny, defer, or denounce this very correct and proper sentence. My attorneys have repeatedly counseled me to appeal. However, that is not what I want. I believe now, and always have in the death penalty. To those who oppose the death penalty, I say, in my particular case, anything short of death would be cruel and unusual punishment. I am of sound mind and body and have been seen by psychoanalysts who can verify that I am capable of making a clear and rational decision. I have given clear and careful thought and consideration, so there is nothing that will cause me to change my mind. I only ask for what I deserve. Let the torture and suffering in me end. Please allow me the right to be at peace. Respectfully, I kind of wish that he would just fucking rot in a cell forever, but, you know, what do I know? He did have a separate trial for the execution of his family, and during this trial, the prosecuting attorney read a letter. This was a letter that Ronald wrote to his daughter, Sheila, professing his love to her, and this caused Ronald to lash out and punch the prosecuting attorney in the face and to try to grab a deputy's handgun, so obviously that trial did not go well for him either. I think the one thing I hate about this case is, and I feel like, I always go back and forth on the death penalty. I'm not going to give you guys my opinion because it doesn't fucking matter what I think, right? But I feel like it's hard. It's like, how do you determine whether somebody should live or die? This is my thought process. This motherfucker wants to die. He wants to be put out of his misery. So me, in my sick brain, I say give him the opposite. Make him suffer. Make him sit in a jail cell and rot. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Feel free to debate me on this because I'm open to discussion. But like... I feel like this guy is really insistent on being put to death, and therefore I feel like he should just fucking sit and twiddle his thumbs every day until he dies of natural causes. But the judge set an execution date, which I get because he killed so many people, and that date was June 27th, 1988, to which Ronald replied to the judge, thank you. Now, what I love about this is I'm going to circle it back into politics. So the Arkansas Churches for Life filed many petitions on Ronald's behalf against his wishes, and his case was taken under review. But thankfully, his sentence was upheld very shortly after on July 11th, and the Arkansas governor at the time, I don't know if you guys have heard of him, he's not like super well known, but his name is Bill Clinton. So the Arkansas governor, Bill Clinton, again, I don't know if you know who he is, set a new execution date for August 9th. The church decided to be fucking pieces of shit some more. Some more appeals happen. But then there's a stay of execution because how the fuck are you going to appeal somebody like this? I'm sorry. I am not trying to knock religion. Sincerely. But how the fuck are you going to make a case for somebody like this? I I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. Poor choice of words. But seriously, like how? 
So on February 6th, 1989, that is the trial that he has for his family where he punches the prosecutor in the face and tries to grab the gun. It obviously does not go well. This is for the murder of all of his relatives, and the jury only took four hours to deliberate. Not surprising. They found him guilty of 14 counts of murder. He was sentenced to death. So now there was another execution date set for March 16th, 1989. Unfortunately, there was again another stay of execution, but our boy Bill signed a proclamation setting a firm non-negotiable date for June 25th, 1990. Bill was done with this guy. Respect to Bill Clinton. Ronald went into the death cell on Friday, June 22nd. This was exactly two and a half years from the day that he began his spray. The following Monday, the 25th, he entered the execution chamber shortly before 9 p.m. When asked if he had anything to say, he said, quote, I want to say just a few words. Justice delayed, finally be done, is justifiable homicide. Ronald died by lethal injection, which was his choosing, and he was pronounced dead at 919. Two days later, on Wednesday, the 27th, June of 1990, he was buried in a common field after relatives wouldn't claim his body. His burial site remains unmarked and unknown to this day. And that is the story of Ronald Gene Simmons, the father from hell. I don't even want to say anything after this case because I just feel ick, but fuck. Normally, I say if you liked what you heard today, but I don't think you did. So if you support the podcast, please like, review, subscribe. There are so many of you that subscribed like on Apple, but didn't leave a review, like 300 of you. Just an FYI, you could leave a five star and you don't even have to write a review. And that's like super fucking helpful. So please do it for the love of God. It helps me grow. The more I grow, the more I can do. So if you want more, please. Just do it. Thank you. Love you so much. You can find me on all social media at fthatpod, except for Instagram at fthat underscore pod. The website is up and running, still in progress, but almost there, fthatpod.com. 